in my journey, I've realized that research is a really great tool and I can be really great at it and I can teach my students how to do it. But for me, doing research and publishing just doesn't, it does, it's not my jam. I don't, I don't look forward to it. I like the like collecting data part and analyzing that, but other like the writing part of it is just not for me. Um, I think I'm a great researcher. I think I'm a great um, oral communicator. I'm going to go to APHA. I think I'll continue to do small bouts of research. Um, and I think I know a lot about research. I'm, you know, I'm pretty literate, I would say. But for me, I just, you know, being a full-time tenure track, really focused on, on research for me, it was just like, is there anything else I can do? Um, you know, I'll be pretty blunt in saying that I also didn't have the portfolio coming out of my PhD to get a tenure track position at an R1. And I want to be very vulnerable in that space because a part of it was that I was not prepared and part of it was probably because I wasn't prepared because I wasn't interested in it. Um, and I think for folks, you know, PhDs can do a lot of different things. And yes, they are meant to teach you how to be really rigorous, really, really, really great researchers. But they can also help you get to spaces without being researchy. Um, Welcome to Public Health Careers. I'm your host, Omari Richards, founder of the Public Health Millennial. We're going to dive deep into public health topics and career journeys. You'll hear diverse career stories, absorb professional development and career strategies, get tips while also learning from others to help you in your own journey and learning of public health. Learn about the vast world of public health, public health careers, or just hear public health stories. Stay tuned so we can do our part towards a culture of health, well-being, and equity for all. Welcome to Public Health Careers. In today's episode, you'll hear more about one, sharing her reasons for pursuing a PhD but not wanting to pursue a postdoctoral, two, the difference and importance of the narrative shift from sexual education to sexuality education, and three, living your life for yourself and surrounding yourself with passions such as volleyball and teaching. Be sure to hit that subscribe button if you love the show and want to get some more value from it so you can stay up to date with all this great content. Leave a five-star review and share this with someone who will get some value from it. It really helps the show get out to more people and helps us increase our reach and help other people understand what they can do in public health. And if you'd like to support the show, you could, there's a link below to become a one-time contributor or a monthly contributor to support the show and everything that's going on with the Public Health Millennial. So thank you all so much for that. Enjoy the episode. Hi, everybody. My main name is Megan Williams. I am a uh, PhD candidate here at the University of Alabama studying health education and promotion, but I really define myself as kind of a sex education um, specialist, and I am all things... Um, reproductive health, adolescent health, and college health. And today you're listening to Public Health Careers. Today we have someone passionate about improving adolescent and young adult sexual and reproductive health. She's an innovative educator with experience in a variety of public health and sexuality related courses. She conferred a bachelor's in public health at East Carolina University and then a master of public health at East Carolina University. She currently is a PhD candidate in public health education and promotion from the University of Alabama, as well as a graduate research assistant at the University of Alabama in the Department of Health Sciences, while also being part of being a part-time NCAA volleyball referee. And lastly, she is the founder of Young Professionals of Sexual and Reproductive Health. We have Megan Williams, PhD candidate, MPH Chess. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. This was have a cherry sound. Where is it coming? Uh, I messed it up. <laughs> yeah, there it is. There it is. <laughs> but yeah, really, really, really glad to have you. Um, look, looking forward to hearing more about your story and more about your sexual reproductive work that you're doing. So before we get into any of that, how do you identify and how are you doing? Yeah, so my pronouns are she and her. I'm a white heterosexual woman. I live in the South. I think that's really important to acknowledge that um, I'm doing a lot of this work in the South and especially in populations that might be a little bit more vulnerable. Um, <clears throat> so I identify as a lot of different things. Um, I'm a daughter. I'm a girlfriend. I'm a friend. Um, I think I intersect with a lot of different spaces, but I think being in the South is really important to who I am because of the work that's being done and how so much of it needs to be done in the South. And I plan to continue working in the South. Yeah, well, I appreciate you sharing all the intersectionalities of your identity, and I hope that we're able to hear how those things come together in your journey and in your learning of public health and in the work that you're doing. And in that vein, um, talk more about sexual education and its importance. 
Yeah, I mean, I could be here for a whole hour, I think, just talking about this one topic. You know, I really stumbled upon this um, working at the North Carolina School Health Training Center, which is a federally funded um, organization in North Carolina that's hosted at East Carolina. Um, I got to be a graduate assistant and a program manager in that space, really helping um, educators learn how to educate in sex ed. So a lot of um, effective curricula. And that's where I got my start. So I realized that there was just such a big need for sex education when I kind of got my start on the curriculum side. Um, I think everyone should have access to comprehensive, factual, um, culturally appropriate sex ed, but we know that's not the case. Um, we know for many young people, they're learning it from internet sources, from their friends, nothing at all. I teach it in the college space and students now even tell me just horrifying stories about what they learned or what they didn't learn. And so um, <clears throat> I think we have this really narrow view of what sex education is. And it, it comes from this space of fear and from this space of um, being really misunderstood. Um, whereas sex education, or as I like to call it, sexuality education is super broad, right? It teaches us about communication. It teaches us about friendships. It teaches us about, um, you know, kind of unwanted sexual advances. It teaches us about consent. It teaches us how to be better friends, better teammates, better, um, if you're in a, you know, a romantic relationship, how to be a better partner. And so I, I wish there wasn't so much fear around sexuality education because it really is trying to help young people to give them the information and the education they need to make their own decisions about their bodies and about their lives. And that's really what I hope to kind of filter through our conversation today is that there's nothing to be afraid of about sex ed. We want, you know, we are not here to give our values to other people. We're here to help young people figure out what their values are and how they can use that to make really great decisions. So I'm a huge advocate for comprehensive sex ed. I'm going to rally um, at Advocacy Day in Montgomery, Alabama next week. Um, so just a huge component of it. Um, and I hope other people would love to learn more about what sexuality ed is because I love it. Yeah, I love that. Love that. And, and I would love to hear more about the Th that that dynamic switch in like sex ed to sexuality ed and and wh why do you think that's important? Yeah, well, I think when you think of traditional sex ed, you think of what you know sexually transmitted infections are, how to prevent them, and how to prevent pregnancy, which are very important parts of sexuality education but only a very small portion of that, right? Many youth are not engaging in sexual activity. So we're telling them all this information about how to prevent disease and how to prevent pregnancy. Some people never engage in an activity where they can get pregnant, right? So we're, we're talking about all these things that may not be relevant to some youth, but communication is relevant, right? I didn't do my homework. My mom is mad at me. Um, my dog ate my homework, whatever it might be, right? Learning how to communicate that you're mad, that you're upset, that somebody hurt your feelings, that somebody touched you and it was inappropriate, right? That's the part of sexuality education that I think is so crucial. And we really don't have any other space within kind of curricular education right now that really teaches that. You know, maybe if you're in theater or maybe if you're playing a sport, you might kind of talk about communication and teamwork and that. But sex ed is a super great way to be able to kind of integrate some of those other topics. Um, I mean, you think about... Um, like sexual health, which is a big in what I do, right? Learning how to go to the doctor. What do you need to get tested for? How do you talk to your doctor? What happens if something goes wrong? How to tell your partner you might have an STI. Um, so I think really trying to broaden <laughs> what sex ed is and, um, you know, talking about, you know, unwanted advances and, you know, the Me Too movement and that stuff. And, you know, even thinking about my own students and them not understanding what inappropriate touch is and what, you know, not giving consent looks like and that it's appropriate in a lot of spaces. They're never taught those things, right? A lot of our youth don't have great home lives and don't have really great examples of what awesome relationships look like. And so they grow up thinking that, you know, being abused verbally, mentally, physically is okay and is normal because that's what they grow up in, right? And so if we can teach them that there are really some behaviors that are not okay, even though they're happening to you and how to get out of it and how to navigate those and how to mitigate that for your friends. So really just broadening what sexuality ed and, you know, that little blurb of sex ed looks like um, for really a more of a kind of wholesome um, education about life and about friendships and about communication. And I think that's important to like shift that narrative to not just focus on the STDs and the, the sex mm -hmm. parts of it, but as you said, like reframing it to think about this as a mechanism to learn more about your body and making right the choices for yourself, as well as like meeting um, how to communicate. And, and I, I feel like that is a, a skill within, within itself that's, that is so important, especially when you're advocating for your health and things that are important to your health. Um, so I, I like that reframing and uh, I hope that I can hear more about this and I hope that's like it's a, a, a more central part of the conversation just so that we are focusing more broadly on all the other aspects of sexuality education as we say now.
Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. And then, uh, so before we get more into like your collegiate journey and, and how you got into yeah. public health, what does public health mean to you? Yo, are you looking for an online community to connect with like-minded health-focused people? Join my free community health and wellness Discord server at the phmillennial.com forward slash join. You'll find growth-focused people talking about important community and personal health topics, networking opportunities, online yoga, book clubs, and more. Be sure to introduce yourself when you join. Link is in the description. Now really, back to the show. Yeah, you know, I, I realized that when I was an undergrad, I had never heard of public health. I came into it as a biology major. And so when I think about public health, I think of serving whole communities and serving groups as a whole. How do we get them programming and curricula and information at the, at the community level and at the population level instead of at the personal level? Um, so when I think about clinical care and why I didn't go into nursing, it was because I wanted to be in the side of prevention. So public health to me is prevention, is trying to mitigate disease before it happens, prevent disease in large scales. Um, it's using a lot of theory, it's using a lot of science, it's using um, a lot of community to work together to help communities and populations um, prevent disease instead of trying to kind of work in that sick care model that our clinical care um, system works in. So to me, public health is awesome. <laughs> it's it's uh, something that I love to do. I think you can integrate public health into so many different spaces, um, but I really think at its core, it's using science and using kind of data to prevent disease at larger levels instead of just in individual levels on the community level, the, you know, neighborhood level at the church level, um, kind of the SEM model and in all those different spaces other than the individual. Public health is very broad, that's for sure. And yeah, and I, I appreciate you sharing that. And that is very similar to a lot of other people. And I'm, I'm excited to hear like more about like your story and your mindset and your thought process in including yeah. to like bachelor's program as a biology major, like most of us, like myself, and then how, how public health and like sex ed and sexuality ed came up in, into your, your like, your, your, of your wanting to like do this kind of work in, in this kind of public health population level um, perspective. So taking backtrack there. So you got your bachelor's in public health at yep. East Carolina University. Mm -hmm. So what was your thought process going into this? And, and I know that you said you didn't start off as a public health major. So yeah, so I was a competitive volleyball player in high school. Um, I actually walked on to the team at ECU and under scholarship. So I was a DB1 athlete um, and I got to school and I ended up, I don't know how I ended up in public health. I think I just thought biology was boring, but um, <laughs> I decided that I was, I had heard of this cool thing called public health and other people were doing it. And so I decided to try it out and I had an awesome experience. I think I, I realized that I loved my public health classes and I didn't love my science classes. And so I started to realize, you know, I wasn't as good at my hardcore science classes, physics and orgo, and I took all of them. Um, and I did fine, but I just didn't love them. I did them because I had to. Um, and so, um, you know, unfortunately, I didn't have a lot of time in undergrad to really get into public health because of being an athlete. Um, we had kind of ate, slept, breathed volleyball and, and working out. So for me, um, I kind of just got through it and didn't really get to do internships. I didn't get to, I did get to study abroad um, in London, which I can talk about, which was awesome. And I think that really kind of um, spurred my love for global public health and something that I hope to do with my students um, at Texas A&M in the future. Um, but, you know, after, interestingly enough, my story after I graduated, <laughs> I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had met my um, chair of my department, who's currently my chair at the University of Alabama. I walked into his office and I said, hey, I need a job. <laughs> Do you know anybody hiring? Um, and that's how I got um, hooked into the School Health Training Center, um, which I think was just really a kind of a struck of lightning. Um, I loved it. It was, it was some of the best years of working through my master's. Um, I actually applied to nursing school. I got in and I something fell off. Um, I just, my sister and I applied to the same schools. We got in, we're going to go together. It's going to be great. And something in my soul just said, this isn't for you. Something's holding you back. Something's telling you not to do this. So I turned it down, even though I did a lot of work to get in. And I think it's really important to, when you're navigating degrees to figure out where your heart lies and, um, what is interesting to you? What do you think you could do for the rest of your life? Um, so I ended up applying to the same master's program at East Carolina I stayed in my graduate assistantship, completed my master's. Um, and I actually coached a high school volleyball team doing that and teaching and going to school full time. So that's a lot to answer your question. But coming out of undergrad, I was lost in the sauce. I had no idea. <laughs> I didn't know that I didn't even know sex ed existed in undergrad. Um, I was kind of into just like disease prevention in general and good athlete health, I think. 
Um, I had some mental health struggles through my athlete journey. And so I think that was maybe an area I was interested in, but I don't know where I would be if I hadn't gotten my um, graduate assistantship out of my undergrad. Okay. Well, well, thank you for sharing that. And I, I, like, I love the transparency and just hearing, you know, like a lot of us, and I'm guessing that many people that are listening to this, maybe like going to the same thing. They applied to med, med school, they applied to nursing school, they applied to PA school, and some of them uh, probably got in and then they decided to turn it down because they know like this is a big decision and it's not, as you said, it's not where your heart lies. And you know that like any, going into any type of school is a lot of hard work and it, I definitely do not recommend it if you're not 100% sure of doing it. And, mm -hmm. and I think we'll get into that in a little bit. But I wanted to hear more about your perspectives as a student athlete and coming into undergrad, walking onto the team, which is impressive in itself. So, okay. so that's awesome. And uh, shout out to you for that. But I wanted to hear more about like what that looked like for you as a student and, and then maybe any takeaways from that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was wildly unprepared. Um, I, I was, you know, I was really athletic. I'm really short. I'm about 5'1". So my opportunities to play collegiate volleyball were really slim in general. Um, I had some D2 and D3 offers, but I just wanted a bigger college experience. My high school was pretty small. Um, I was really surprised that I made the team at ECU. I was really athletic, and I think I had a lot of heart. Um, it was a rough four years. <laughs> um, I was really the athlete and student athlete. Um, I didn't have a lot of court time. Um, I physically just wasn't as talented as the other girls, but I gained a lot of experience from my time. Some of the best friends. Um, I learned a lot about the game. Um, I got to travel all across the world. I got to study abroad. Um, I was on our student athlete advisory committee, which kind of gave me some leadership and um, opportunities. Um, and I think it, you know, really drove my discipline and it teaches you a lot about teamwork. And so I think, you know, there were some ups and downs in terms of, you know, I really wanted to play a lot and I just wasn't good enough. And for me, I wanted to be a part of the team and I wanted to have the experience, but um, playing just wasn't as important to me. And, and I think there were so many other benefits to being a student athlete. Um, it was physically taxing. It was mentally taxing. Um, again, I had some mental health struggles like many of my teammates. And so I think that made it a little bit more challenging. Um, but I had a ton of academic resources. I had all the tutors in the world I could need. Um, they, you know, every subject, if I needed it on the road, um, you name it, they got it for us. And so I think there's there's always cons to any situation, but I think what's, what can you take out of it? And I really think it was a blessing in disguise. I was going to transfer to UNC Chapel Hill after my freshman year. And just once I made the team, I said, you know what, this is pretty cool. I'm traveling the country. I'm playing volleyball. I don't play on the court a lot, but it's still pretty cool. Um, and I think that being in my home department set me up for the rest of my career. I mean, my same chair is where I'm here at Alabama now. And I think that's just a struck of lightning. And I happened to study abroad that semester and we made really good connections and I was a really good student and I knew it. Um, and so I think just, you know, staying true to the, the student and student athlete um, and using that to my advantage. Okay. Well, yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. And I, I know it is tough being a student athlete. Uh, there's a lot of demands both on the student side and on the athlete side. So like balancing that is definitely something that is difficult for many people. And uh, still shout out to you, regardless of how much court time you got for walking on to any team, especially Division One. It is impressive. So so uh, that, that's really cool. And and you also mentioned you, you did do study abroad. And I think you went to Spain, you said. Do you know, talk a little bit more about that experience? Yeah, yeah, we got to go to London. Um, so we oh, were in London Sorry. for about two weeks. Yeah, no, totally fine. Um, the summer for my, um, my senior year. So I graduated a semester early somehow. I don't know how in the <laughs> world that worked out, but I, <laughs> so, you know, awesome. I wish I could have gone for a whole semester. Um, I kind of kick myself now for not saving. We didn't have any full semester options. Um, at least in my home department, I could have taken like a nutrition class and gone to like Italy and made pasta, but there were no um, full semester opportunities. But I think it really, we got to go to a lot of, I mean, public health is huge in London. So we did, you know, uh, the British Heart Association. We did um, obviously the um, public health service. We did, we got to go to some really cool um, public health spaces within London. We also got to, Ca I went to Cambridge. We could have gone to York. We got to go to, we, see, we saw Wimbledon. Um, so I think they really did a great job of combining the educational component in public health and honestly just kind of letting us experience culture abroad. Um, I wish I could have stayed forever. I kind of think maybe at some point in the future I'll end up back over there. Um, I'm not doing a postdoc, but maybe um, I'll have some time to do a sabbatical there in a couple years. I don't know. 
Um, but I think it really just sparked my love for global public health and seeing other cultures and how they handle medicine. And um, it's very different. It's socialized medicine, which is so different than, you know, what we have here. And so I think I'm really able to use that in the classroom. And I wish every student could study abroad. I wish they could go for a whole semester. I wish it was affordable. Um, I wish it was safe in all these places. It's, it's not, unfortunately. Um, but one of my big goals, I think, as a incoming faculty member is to go on one every summer. Um, and trying to find scholarships and grant funding to help students who can't financially do it because I think it just gives you such a more well-rounded view of the world and I think we have a very narrow perspective of medicine and healthcare and public health in the U.S. and our students learn that and so trying to expand that and what they know especially um, if they come from a small town some of, like I know people here in Alabama who've never been out of Alabama so just trying to give them like the world is a little bit different in different right. spaces and I mean, you may not like it you may not be for you but other people kind of have different lived experiences and how can you learn about those and kind of integrate them into who they are yeah and I, and I think like just understanding that people live differently and like to your point you don't have to agree with it it might be mm -hmm. for you but just understand that it's possible and it's out there yeah. and like uh there's so much out there yeah so, so, yeah. so definitely have to advocate for that. But yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you were able to get that experience. And then before we move past your bachelor's program, were there like any key takeaways that you had overall in your bachelor's program? You know, I didn't realize how rigorous it was when I was in it. Um, <laughs> um, I think really learning so I'm in health education specifically and we know that not everybody in public health is in health education so my degrees are specifically in health ed which is kind of that public health planning and program and evaluation and theory and it's very nitty-gritty um, and not everybody in public health does that um, so for me I didn't take I was on the pre-health track so I didn't take um, program planning and program evaluation and theory but it's such a great basis um, so I think for me, the biggest takeaway was like, you can do something with this. Um, it's very technical. Like you, I have my, M, my Chez now, I'll sit for my M Chez in a year or two, maybe. Um, so I think that there, I didn't know it at the time, but what I was learning was super foundational to a career in public health. Um, and so for me, I think I'm glad I went to a program that was really strong at, at the undergrad level. And I would highly encourage that for young people and students now is to find a program that's accredited and that's doing really awesome stuff. And that alum are doing really great stuff um, because you can come right out of your bachelor's and do like on the ground boots on the ground public health. Um, I didn't, <laughs> um, I did a little bit, you know, a little bit different, um, but I would encourage folks to do the kind of traditional health ed route instead of the free health track um, just because you can come out doing something just like nursing just like you know um biology you can do so much with just the simple bs in public health um but i actually couldn't sit for the chess exam after i finished my bachelor's because i did the pre-health track and at the time again i didn't take theory and programming and evaluation so i had to wait until i got my master's so i would encourage folks to do that at the undergrad level so they can immediately come out and get that and, and get the ball rolling Absolutely. Great, great um, advice and insights. And just for people that might be thinking about the chess, just like understanding that as, as a perspective is important as well. Um, okay, so you graduated from your bachelor's program and then you became a research assistant at East Carolina University School of Medicine and then mm -hmm. at administrative support specialist at NC School Health Training Center. So do you want to talk about those two experiences? Yeah, so again, after my undergrad, I was really lost. <laughs> I graduated a semester early. I don't know how. Again, I think I came in with a lot of credits. Um, and I was just kind of looking for like anything in public health. I didn't really have a specific interest. We weren't trained in one specific area. You know, public health was so broad. So we got all of the different, you know, five different areas. Um, and there was a really cool study going on at the School of Medicine. They were looking at basically entrance characteristics of their, of their med students and where they ended up um, practicing. And so I was just doing some basic... Um, data cleaning and analysis and trying to help figure out if there's anything in particular, because the goal of East ECU's medical school is to get students to stay in Eastern North Carolina and in rural areas in North Carolina. And so they were really trying to figure out like, are there specific characteristics about folks who stay in North Carolina? Um, that project only lasted, I was only on it, I think for about six to eight months. Um, it just wasn't giving me, it was really, it was cool to be a part of, but it wasn't doing much for my career. It, 
very cut and dry. There was no, I wasn't learning anything. Um, so really cool to be a part of, but I was only on it for a short amount of time. And that's when I asked Dr. Cheney if they had anybody hiring um, at, in kind of research in our department that could be a, maybe a little bit more tailored, a little bit more hands-on. And that's when I got to be the, um, I was actually a full-time staff member for eight months in between my bachelor's and my master's um, at the training center. Um, a blessing in disguise, like I said. So we um, basically held professional development for teachers learning how to teach sex ed. So there were five or six different curricula, um, making proud choices, reducing the risk, some other ones. Um, some, uh, and we, I was in charge of kind of all of the program management and signing people up and getting them um, registered and what happens if things goes wrong and getting the materials and doing evaluation. And it was really my first kind of exposure to program management and to what federally funded um, grant training centers look like. There were a lot of stipulations, you know, with grant funding, they always, you know, how many people showed up? What was the fidelity like? Um, did you change anything? And so it was really this holistic kind of, because I didn't get that program planning in undergrad, I was like, what is happening? But then as my, I got into my master's, um, I kind of put the two and two together. So I was in that kind of faculty role for about eight months. And then once I started my master's, I continued it for the next like year and a half. Okay. And talking to that point right there about like not having that program planning skill or skill set or understanding, how did you gain it in this position coming out of your bachelor's program? Yeah, so I took a patient education class from a, my actually my current dissertation chair, which is a little bit about like, how are you going to use the framework of planning and a little bit of theory and a little bit of eval in a clinical setting. So I had a basic understanding, but I didn't learn any, I didn't learn in depth of theory. So I think it was just more of where you're learning it as you go. So like, I never heard the term fidelity. I was like, what is that? Right? Like, what are we doing with this program? What is evaluation? What do you mean? We need to know how many people were there? Like, um, what is process evaluation? So I think my faculty members and my bosses, um, one of my best mentors, um, taught me kind of as I went. And I think she knew that I was a fast learner. I was interested and I was curious. And so I'd be like, why are we doing this? Like, why, why did they, why do they need to know how many people were there? <clears throat> and then she'd be like, oh, we're doing process evaluation. Um, <clears throat> so I think it was just having a really great mentor and a supervisor that understood where I was coming from, but also that I was super eager to learn. And I never turned down a challenge. I never was like, this is too hard. I just kind of asked questions, a lot of questions. <clears throat> and wasn't afraid to be wrong or say I didn't know because I was coming from that space where I really didn't know. Right, that, that's a beautiful space to come from once you are able to like acknowledge that and say, okay, this is where I am. And to become better in this role, uh, it would be ideal for me to ask the questions and to lead and like in, in, to your point or in your situation, go out there and find ways that you can build like foundational um, skill sets to, to continue to build on top of that so you can be effective in your role. So you got your master's of public health in health behavior at East Carolina University. You also said a little bit earlier that you applied to nursing school and you turned that down and then you decided to get your master's of public health. So walk us through that thought process of, of nursing school, applying, getting in, then saying no, and then choosing to get a master's of public health degree. Yeah, so my original plan going into undergrad was dental school. Um, I don't know why, I just decided the dental school was for me. Um, I actually um, did like a preparing tomorrow's dentist program for future dentists in undergrad, which was really great until I saw a tooth extracted without <laughs> lidocaine, and I was like, yeah, I'm not doing this. Um, I'm also not very like spatially aware I don't have a good sense of viewing whole options or items from like the side of it and I was like I don't think my skills line up well enough um so I nixed dental school about halfway through undergrad thought I was going to either go to nursing school or PA school so I was kind of taking all of their prereqs for just like medicine um <clears throat> I don't I think I didn't apply to PA school because I didn't have um enough hours I didn't have any hours because I was coming out as an athlete so I was like oh well nursing school is the next best thing so I was like I can be an NP um you know whatever and yeah my sister and I we applied to this two of the same school she's she's about seven years older than me she'd been a dermatology assistant she was real knowledgeable we were going to go through ABSN programs kind of you know fast track nursing programs we both got in and I just something about saying yes just felt off to me um I'll be honest, I only applied to ECU's Master's of Public Health program. Um, I think that was a mistake. Um, looking back now, I, I kind of wish I had gone to a program that was maybe in maternal child health 
or either, or either sexual and reproductive health, but I didn't know those existed. And I got a really comprehensive, because I was in the training center, I got professional development like every week. So I, I kind of used my graduate assistantship to really um, add to my master's program. Um, but I did kind of, kind of, I got the basics that I needed in my master's program. Um, but advice would be to apply to multiple programs. Um, I kind of wish I had taken more time to figure out what I wanted to get my master's in. Um, the MPH is so broad. I mean, you get your MPH in health behavior. Um, but I wish I had maybe thought about where I was going to get it from. But for me, it was really affordable. I was living in the same town. I loved my professors. I did a little bit of research. Um, I got to keep my graduate assistantship. I got to coach high school volleyball. I was really involved in a local club volleyball. Um, I was our operations director. So for me, it was, it was an easy decision. Um, it was affordable. You know, I could teach. I got to teach um, health, um, personal health throughout my master's too. So that was really cool. Um, I got to be an instructor of record at like 21. Um, they let me in the classroom and that's really where I garnered my love for teaching. So, you know, I think there was a lot of, a lot of things that turned out really well. Um, but yeah, it was the only program I applied to. I don't know if that was the right decision, but here we are. Hey, yes, yes, we absolutely are here right now. And I, and I think <laughs> I'm glad that you're being like transparent and, and sharing yeah. that, you know, like you, you applied to this program, you wish you applied to more programs. Um, and I think that's good insights for anyone that is thinking about a master's of public health program, like really think about what are the things that you're trying to gain from the program, because like you said, they are broad and it's really up to you to to direct and get what you need out of an MPH program. And I like the point as well as you saying, like using the MPH program and the graduate assistantship to kind of diversify what you're getting from it. And as well, as you said earlier, that that you didn't know about sexuality education while you're also saying that you wish that you got an MPH in like material and child health or sexuality education. So where, where, what was the thought process of like going into the MPH? What, what were you thinking you, you're going to get from this and come out of it or like any, any ideas there? <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I'll be super transparent with you. I would think I'm a pretty goal-oriented person, and I knew the end goal was going to be a terminal degree. Um, that's just kind of who I am. Um, and so for me, the MPH was really just kind of a stepping stone. Um, I would say I'd always envisioned myself as a professor. I don't know why. And I've come to realize research really isn't my jam. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't think there was a ton of thought into my MPH. I think it was easy. I think it was, again, it was affordable. I knew I was going to gain information and the, you know, kind of foundation of public health, really in health ed that I didn't have. Um, it wasn't going to cost a ton of money. I didn't have to move. Um, you know, it's recognized. I had really great professors. I got to continue my relationships with my professors that I had before. Um, I think I was in a really weird headspace after undergrad and I really didn't know who I was. And I think it was really grounding to be in a space that I was comfortable with. Um, you know, now I think I wish I had kind of gotten out of my comfort zone and gone somewhere new um, because you learn so much about yourself and about the discipline and the lens that the program kind of sees public health through can be so different in different places. Um, but yeah, there wasn't a ton of thought other than like, this is affordable, this is easy, it's going to get me to the next step and then I can really think about where I'm going to go from here. And um, I think the master's... <clears throat> I was a little lost, so I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. And I was like, well, I can at least start out making a little bit more money with the master's. Um, I can get into kind of like, you know, the um, public health specialist too, or like some of the little bit of the higher roles with your master's. Um, and it wasn't going to be super burdensome. Um, so I think it was kind of an easy, safe decision for me instead of kind of like a really going out on a limb. Yeah, absolutely fair. And uh, yeah, thank you for sharing. So while you were in your MPH program, you kept that graduate assistantship but then you were also mm -hmm. a project manager and graduate assistant at, oh, is this, is this the same? <laughs> I'm just reading. Really, really it is. They're just technically different. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And did, did you have to, was there any increased workload with the, the new role that you had at NC School Health Training Center? Yeah. So, you know, my role actually went down. So as a faculty member, you have a little bit more freedom. So like I could write contracts, I could rent vehicles, I could, um, I had a little bit more freedom as a student, kind of some of that is taken away. So I really, my role didn't change a whole lot, except I didn't have as much administrative. Um, obviously I was working 40 hours a week 
from January to August of that year in that kind of program manager role. And then when I moved into a graduate assistantship, it was only 20 hours a week, 10 hours a week. I don't know. It was like cut in half. Um, and so just my responsibilities went from a whole lot being there every day, um, going to professional development, leading, you know, I was responsible for getting, I think we had 25 counties, 20 counties that we were partnered with. And I was responsible for like, what do you want to do? What professional development do you need? When do you want to set it up? How are you going to get there? Who are these trainers? So there was a lot of responsibility on me, I think, when I first started, but that decreased. Um, I kind of also got the ball rolling and things were kind of playing and it was just management. Um, but not a ton. Um, I was also teaching at the time. So I think they understood that I had duties in kind of multiple spaces. Um, and they took the, they, we had another graduate assistant too. And so they kind of took some of that responsibility as well. Okay. And was that the teaching that you were doing at Health 1000, as a Health 1000 instructor at East Carolina University? Or is that something different? <clears throat> That's something different. That was an, an additional graduate assistantship that I did. Okay. Yeah, please, please share about both of those a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, so um, Health 1000 is kind of a lower level personal health class, and it is set up in a way where it's kind of, you're more of a facilitator. So materials are made, PowerPoints are made, lectures are made, um, tests are made, and you really are just responsible for kind of delivering the information. Um, but I did a lot of work on my own and kind of, um, so the first semester you just get to kind of watch, and then you get to teach one lesson, and then every semester after that you're responsible for um, anywhere from one section to kind of three or four sections, depending on how much time you want to allot and how much your contract is for. <clears throat> so I generally had one to two classes um, and I got to teach personal health. So we talked about cardiovascular disease and smoking and, and um, sexual health. We talked about um, like cancer risk and sunscreen and kind of a health class at the college level, kind of like the um, mimicking class of like gym class in college um but i did a lot of work so we made a lot of activities um we we had a really cool sexual health unit that my other job kind of created and so me and a couple other professors mimicked that in the other lessons and so they did a lesson on sleep we learned about stress um so it was i had never taught before kind of professionally i was a coach but um it was a really cool i you know i i don't think teaching's for everybody but I think if anybody has the opportunity to teach, especially in that kind of managed where you don't have a ton of responsibility, but you do have some freedom, I would take it and run with it because it's so cool. It's so rewarding um, and can really help you figure out whether you like teaching or not. Yeah, absolutely. And what, what about teaching made you want to do it more or made you fall into it? Because you said, you said that this is something that you enjoy doing. Yeah, you know, um, I think about my educators that I had in kind of K-12 and even in college. And, you know, there were some that just could kick rocks, you know, just <laughs> like did it. They were not excited to be there. They had been there for a while. You're not lying, um, though. <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, they didn't love the discipline. Right. You know, teaching today is, is a whole nother, you know, whole nother issue. But I think for me, I really wanted students to have a good experience in the classroom. You know, I think I'm passionate about public health, which helps. Um, I think I'm young, I'm energetic, I haven't been beaten down by the system yet. So I'm coming in with a lot of liveliness and a lot of passion. And I think my students really jive off that. Um, but you know, I think what, what I really enjoy is the relationships. Um, even after they graduate and they come back and they're like, you know, this class was super cool or something we did in the, this class is the reason I'm in this internship or, you know, we were learning about consent and I realized that my relationship was unhealthy. Whatever it is, it's kind of, you know, helping them connect class information to what they're doing in the world. Um, and just being a you know, kind of a positive role model and a trusted adult, I find that I know all my students' names and I find that a lot of my students have never had a positive representation in the classroom. Um, I don't look like all of my students, you know, I, I don't identify with the races or the ethnicities or the genders, but I think I am someone that they feel comfortable coming to. And that's what's important to me. Um, you know, <clears throat> if they have a death in the family, if um, their dog dies, if, you know, they're in a crash, whatever happens, I find that they're comfortable coming to me. And that's so great because I don't know that I had a ton of teachers like that. And I think you can, I always say you can't change the world, but you can change someone's world. And um, I hope to just be kind of a positive light to their day, um, even if they hate public health or, you know, Effie is boring sometimes. They can be like, Miss W tried really hard. She really cared about me. She cared about the discipline. Effie's whatever. But <laughs> so just being that kind of positive representation and teaching and helping them grow to love whatever discipline we're talking about, whether it's public health or sex ed or whatever it might be. Yeah, love that. And just like showing up as you would have liked your teachers to show up and not just kick rocks around. So yeah. 
appreciate that. I had some good teachers. Let me take that back. They were awesome, but there were some, maybe not so much. Yeah, yeah, I understood, I understood. And, and then um, you also said that you were a volleyball coach during this time for a high school. So tell us about that experience as well as tell us about like balancing, <laughs> balancing or, not, or like not balancing all of this and just like handling it. Yeah, so I was independent after I got my, I was really lucky and then I had financial support throughout my undergrad. <clears throat> when I hit my graduate degree, I was on my own. Um, and I'm so privileged. I understand that many, many people don't have financial support through undergrad. Um, but for me, I like being financially secure. Um, and I had a really bad boundaries issue. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I had this really cool opportunity to be an assistant coach of our JV team in my town. Um, I had been pretty successful at the club level. And I was like, you know what, this sounds like fun. I have free time, of course. Um, we ended up going 22 and one. It was such a killer season. They were amazing. Uh, many of them are going to play in college now. Um, just a great, I had a great varsity head coach and assistant coach. My girls were great. Um, <clears throat> it probably wasn't <laughs> a good decision. I probably should have used that time to like take a nap or like eat something. Um, but I think it made me probably a lot of joy. And I, I, I would like to say I'm a decent coach. I don't know. We can ask some of my former players. Um, but I think it was, you know, sometimes you have to take risks and sometimes they work out and sometimes they don't. Um, for me, I think it was really rewarding. Obviously, I moved after that next year, so I didn't get to continue. But we had such a successful season. The girls were great. So much support. Um, and I just was like a chicken with my head cut off running around all the time. <laughs> um, but a super cool experience. Um, I think if I was, you know, I got paid to teach and I got paid to do my graduate assistantship, but I had to pay tuition and I'm still I still have a little bit of loans. Um, so for me, I think it was a financial decision, although it was like $800 for the whole season. So it really wasn't doing much. Um, I think when you love something, you give up a lot of other things to do that. Um, and I sacrifice sleep and friendship sometimes for, you know, practice every day of the week. Um, we had a really great season. So, you know, the only complaint is that I didn't get to sleep a lot, but I think they had a good season and, um, really happy and privileged to have been a part of that group. And, um, Again, don't know if I'd do it again, but I'm really glad I did. And, um, you know, you kind of learn from it and move on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate you sharing that. And I, I know, like, for others out there who might be thinking about taking on a little bit too much, just take a note from Megan, you know, like, <laughs> maybe you might need to take that on and uh, really, you know, try to find things that are a little bit more balanced. Uh, granted, like, mm -hmm. at some point, some points in life, like, there just, it, it just is going to be unbalanced and you have to be fine with that as well no. okay so a little bit earlier you said you wanted to get your, your goal was to, to have a terminal degree and then yeah. in that so you 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 are right now a phd candidate in public health education and promotion at the university of alabama what was your thought process going into this phd and like Right now, we're talking a lot about sexuality education. When mm -hmm. did that come up as like a theme, like of of like what you wanted to study and research and and teach about? Like, tell us about that like thought process. That yeah, yeah. So, sorry. Um, you know, I I will be super transparent and say I had a very non-traditional path to my PhD. I think I'm very privileged in the sense that my current chair is my was my previous chair at my last institution. And he, one day we kind of sat down and talked about the opportunity of doing a PhD at Alabama. Um, it was the only program I applied to. I really had not thought about going to get one. I was like, I'm going to go work in sex ed somewhere and it's going to be great. Um, and then he kind of he was, he told me he was leaving and that, you know, there were like, opportunities for assistantships. Obviously I had to apply. He didn't even admit me. I got admitted um, by another faculty member. And so I got in and I was like, I will be transparent. I have an assistantship that pays for everything. So all of my tuition is covered. Um, <clears throat> they pay for health insurance. And then I get, um, you know, I'm 20 hours a week, 20 research and 20 teaching, and I get paid to do that. So to be transparent, I'm not paying for my, my PhD, which is such a blessing and a privilege and you know I highly recommend if you're gonna do it get it paid for because it's a lot um there's a ton of funding out there um 
And I think I just realized that I, because my terminal degree was the end, I, I always kind of saw myself in administration. I don't know why. I don't know. I don't even think admin's fun, but I just kind of <laughs> see myself as kind of this like principal-esque person in, ad, in academia. And so I was like, well, I think now's the time. I love my chair and I think it's so important. I want to highlight that who you have in your corner is invaluable. Um, my current chair, um, the chair of the department and my current dissertation chair is his wife have just been kind of the rocks for me here at UA. And I think they're always in my corner. They know who I am as a student. And I think they were one of the big reasons that I'm here now. Um, they are fantastic mentors. They're great leaders. They're great communicators. And I knew what I was getting out of a PhD program. And I knew that I was going to get really, really great mentorship. Um, there's actually two other faculty members, two other people from ECU now at Alabama. So maybe there's a pipeline, I don't know. But um, <clears throat> I think it just kind of fell into place. And I think I, it's really important to kind of read the signs of what's happening in the universe. And sometimes opportunities arise and you don't know why. And so I think I took a big risk, but um, <clears throat> it's a three-year program. It's super quick. Um, and so I think I was like, well, the pros are really outweighing the cons right now. I don't have a plan. It's something I want to end up with. I know it's going to be a great education. I know I'm going to get great mentorship. And so here I am. And, and in speaking to all of that, was there any like general reason that you wanted to say, like, I want to do sexuality education? Mm -hmm. Like, what, what was there like um, a, a moment that, that made you do that? Yeah. So I think when I was in my master's doing my my graduate assistantship, I was like, this is so cool. You can do this full time. Like public health and sexuality intersect and sexuality education is kind of the health education part of public health, right? So you can do the testing side, you can do the clinical side, but really the prevention side is where I kind of grew accustomed to and what I really liked. And so I actually, my mentor from ECU, who was my boss, Dr. Michelle Wallen, I just admire her so much. And she's in this really cool role where she's the, um, I don't know if it's the CEO, I think she's the director of the school health training center. I was like, that's a really cool job. She has a PhD. She gets to basically, you know, apply for federal funding and then implement this in community settings and get to go out and train other educators to do these really cool trainings. I was like, well, I need a PhD to be able to do that. So here's what we're doing. So I think I knew I wanted to be in high spot positions. Again, I don't know why. Um, I'm going to get some boots on the ground training after, but um, <laughs> I think I knew in my master's that I was really excited about sex ed. And when we would do the sex ed lessons in personal health, I was like, this is cool. I'm stoked for this. Saying the word, you know, any of the reproductive words doesn't, I don't find it funny. Like, I think it's great. Um, and I just realized there was such a need when I was talking to my students and that they were so interested in it. Um, there's really a lack of educators in the South um, and especially for kind of marginalized populations and groups that don't traditionally get sex ed. And so I think I was just like, I love it. We need it. I want to continue to do this um, in my PhD. Love that. And I, and I think like it's cool to, to see like you go into public health and then you realize that there's this one topic that intersects with public health that you think is very interesting as well as like there's a huge need for it. As we all know, uh, as we were, everyone listening to this podcast should know that there's a huge need for it. And uh, so, so yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think like going back to the previous point that you're making is like, find ways to get funding for your PhD program. And I don't know if you have any tips around sharing, like what are some ways that people should look for funding as well as having a supportive chair and making sure that the chair for your PhD program is you or you and your chair on the same page because that's very, really, really helpful in the long run. Yeah, well, you know, I think this kind of goes for master's programs too. It's a little bit more general, but in most master's programs now, at least in the B, like the MPH, you have to do some sort of, um, research project. <clears throat> so I think before you apply to a program, you need to look at the faculty and like, what are they doing? Are they doing work that you're interested in? Um, I'll be frankly honest with you. My current chair doesn't do the work that I do, but she's fabulous. And so we make it work. She's a great editor. She knows science. She knows public health. And I, and I have a content person that's also fabulous that can talk about the discipline. So I'm again, kind of a non-traditional case, but I think when you're picking a master's program or a PhD, especially a PhD program, I think the PhD program is way more specific, but even like, what are the people in your program doing? Are they doing work that's similar to yours that you think is interesting? You know, faculty switch and, and change, but there's generally kind of a theme to the faculty. Like a lot of departments are, um, <clears throat> or like health disparities, maybe it's cancer, maybe it's 
um, chronic disease. A lot of public health is chronic disease. And every now and then you get a, when I call SRH to sexual and reproductive health folk, and I'm like, yes, what are we doing? You know, so, um, you know, if you're not interested in diabetes and five out of the six are doing diabetes work, like if you're trying to do a graduate assistantship, you're going to, unless you're really going to learn to like diabetes, it's just not going to work. So, you know, really thinking about doing a ton of research into your master's program about who your faculty are, um, what classes you're taking, because um, <clears throat> there's there's money. Generally, departments have money for master's or PhD. Depends on the program. Depends on the, the university. Um, so who are your faculty going to be? Um, what is there? What's missing? Like if there's a theme, is there anybody missing? Are they hiring? Um, and then in terms of money, I think you have to be pretty <clears throat> PhD programs are a little different, I think, because the general consensus is that a lot of it is funded. Um, but it just, again, kind of depends on the program. I think in master's, I, you know, I didn't get tuition. I got paid to teach and I got paid to do my work and then I just took out loans. But I think there are ways, um, scholarships, um, if you po follow um, women in public health, they do scholarships. Um, I and my group, we can talk about this, Young Professionals of Sexual and Reproductive Health. Um, I follow a lot of organizations like Guttmacher and other groups that give out scholarships for students. Um, the American Public Health Association does them. So I think you just have to be relentless in your pursuit of scholarship money. And like, does your department have scholarship? Are you a part of a professional organization? Um, does your local bank have any scholarships? Um, <clears throat> and trying to do, if you can, assistantship of some sort to kind of offset maybe the cost of living expenses, even if tuition isn't waived. Um, for folks who are minorities, there's a ton of them, especially in like epidemiology and injury prevention. I know Sophie might have one for injury prevention. So they're out there. You just kind of have to tell people, like it's like trying to find a partner, right? You have to tell people that like, I'm interested, I'm looking, and then opportunities come your way. So um, tell everyone and anyone who will listen to you that you need funding. Um, and eventually somebody will know somebody who knows somebody that, you know, that can tell you about scholarships to apply for. But um, yeah, my advice is just to not give up and be annoying and figure out a way to get it funded so you can do this work. Great, great points. And definitely looking out at, at the school that you're trying to apply to and seeing what the majority of people are doing work around and maybe even reaching out to those professors to see mm -hmm. if, if there are potentials for you to like do research or support research that they're doing, I think is very, very important. And yeah, there is funding out there. It's not as easy as it is to find, but it is it is easier than it used to be. So like all you gotta yeah. do is put put your head down and as as Megan said, like reach out to people as well as yeah. use some Google searching, um, reaching out to, to the different schools, different departments and seeing where there are possibilities, maybe even like alumni and seeing um what what they have done to to get funding opportunities and different things like that. Yeah, and my, my other thing would be to reach out to current students. So generally, at least the PhD students are available on websites. I know I am. Um, <clears throat> so reach out to them, like ask them about their experience, what they've learned, whether they like it, whether they don't like it. Is it an online program or is it an in-person program? Um, that can be very different in what you're looking for and what the program offers. They're hopefully pretty consistent, but you know, there's a little bit of difference in an online program and an in-person program. So just talking to people that are in the program or recently graduated, um, if you're involved in APHA or SOFI, they have um, organizations, like you can see a directory list and you can look for students that are at those schools. Um, reach out, say what's up, say hello. Um, I think folks in public health are generally very friendly and very open to connecting. So um, they want to bring good students. You know, I'm always like, hey, you coming to Alabama, you know? So I think just um, not being afraid to reach out to people. And, you know, you may not get responses all the time, but I think for the most part, people are really great. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think people in public health are definitely uh, very open to helping and supporting students. And, you know, sometimes the email might get missed. So reach out again and like mm -hmm. be persistent in, in that process. For sure. And, and so while you're in your PhD program, you were a graduate research assistant and teaching instructor. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk a little bit about those experiences at the University of Alabama? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm in this really great position where our, our PhD assistantships are <clears throat> funded mostly by teaching. So we have not everybody, but most of us are 10 hours teaching and 10 hours research. So we're paired with a faculty member. The process has changed a little bit since I came in. We came in in COVID, right when it ramped up, right in August. So <clears throat> the world was crashing. 
Um, but we do 10 hours a week. So generally we're helping with faculty members with their abstracts and research they're working on. Um, I've worked with my mentor who we did some stuff with in check and um, the Ches exam and figuring out how different um, Ches <clears throat> did their research or did their um, hours during the pandemic. So how to code basically like if they were doing vaccines or if they were doing um, mitigation or, or isolation, whatever that was and what did that correlate to, what hours did that correlate to. Um, I'm doing a little bit of work right now with one of my new faculty members who's fabulous, whose work is around sexual consent, sexual violence and alcohol. And so uh, I'm kind of getting to combine some of my work in sexuality and sexual education and her work in, in <clears throat> sexual violence. So it just kind of depends. Um, but uh, in, that's kind of in terms of research. It's a little mostly about what your faculty member wants to do and how you can help them, but they help you along the way to research presentations and briefs and, and papers and um, you know, I <clears throat> have been really lucky that they, they just kind of say, hey, here's what I'm doing, you know, read this abstract and let me know what you think, or redo this discussion, or um, some week it's working on references, or some week it's doing a systematic lit review. It just kind of depends. Um, some week it's going to conferences, some weeks it's talking to students, it just kind of depends. Um, but in the teaching space, um, which is where I really love, I've gotten to teach five different classes now at UA, some online, some in person, some in the summer, some in the fall and spring. Um, and that's really just because I like teaching. And so my chair has kind of thrown me into new classes um, because he knew I liked it and because he knew that I was good at it. So um, I've gotten to teach stress management, public health, health education, sexuality and society class that I actually adjuncted for. And then a, right now I'm teaching a master's level class about how to teach sex ed. So I am across the span doing all sorts of stuff in public health. And, you know, I really like the versatility of the MPH and um, I'm teaching master students, although I'm a PhD student, which isn't very normal. Um, and so I think it's, I really like teaching. And so I think I've gotten a lot of opportunities to teach different things where most PhD students kind of keep the same class, but most PhD students are going into rigorous postdocs into, um, you know, careers of research and my future job is not. So for me, I wanted really diverse teaching experiences with a really great research foundation um, that I could use to kind of inform my teaching. Yeah, and I appreciate you bringing that up because I wrote that, wrote that down that you do not want to get a postdoc. And so why, why you mentioned that? So like, talk a little bit more about that and like why you don't want to get a postdoc and like, what's your thought process in, in that? <clears throat> yeah, you know, I think research is so cool. I think we could do research until we're blue in the face. Um, I just, you know, I think I, throughout any educational journey, you find what you're passionate about and you figure out what is just, you can do it and you can be good at it, but you just don't love it. Um, and so for me, in my journey, I've realized that research is a really great tool and I can be really great at it and I can teach my students how to do it. But for me, doing research and publishing just doesn't, it does, it's not my jam. I don't, I don't look forward to it. I like the like collecting data part and analyzing that, but other like the writing part of it is just not for me. Um, I think I'm a great researcher. I think I'm a great um, oral communicator. I'm going to go to APHA. I think I'll continue to do small bouts of research. Um, and I think I know a lot about research. I'm, you know, I'm pretty literate, I would say. But for me, I just, you know, being a full-time tenure track really focused on, on research for me it was just like, is there anything else I can do? Um, you know, I'll be pretty blunt in saying that I also didn't have the portfolio coming out of my PhD to get a tenure track position in an R1. And I want to be very vulnerable in that space because a part of it was that I was not prepared and part of it was probably because I wasn't prepared because I wasn't interested in it. Um, and I think for folks, you know, PhDs can do a lot of different things. And yes, they are meant to teach you how to be really rigorous, really, really, really great researchers, but they can also help you get to spaces without being researchy. Um, so my position specifically at A&M is a PhD required, but it's a teaching position. So they really value that research experience, but it's not a research position. So, um, you know, there was, I did apply to some postdocs. I got turned down, to be honest with you. I only applied to a couple, um, but I realized that, you know, your degree is what you make out of it. And regardless of what the world wants you to do and your professors and your parents, I have to go to work every day. And if I'm sitting at my computer bored out of my mind reading about whatever, I'm gonna be miserable. And so I just right. said, you know what? I can always come back to a tenure track position. I applied to a couple and got interviews to be honest with you. So I know they're there. And if I wanted to do them, they'll be there. But honestly, I think I'm gonna really like teaching. I'm gonna incorporate research and um, research skills into my classes, into um, helping my students do research, maybe with an A to Sigma Gamma. 
Um, but being really pinned down to doing kind of just research just didn't speak to me. Yeah, and I appreciate that perspective. And I think that that's the beauty of public health and the beauty of people sharing their stories is like people have different experiences and they value different things. And to your point is like, you have to you live your life and you don't want to be miserable in something that you <laughs> are not like super passionate, super eager to to get into. So I appreciate you sharing that. And I look forward to to the work that you do do that you do do um, outside of like a, a postdoc. So that, that's awesome. And then uh, you also have a role as North Carolina Health Education Curriculum Review Focus Group Coordinator at the NC School Health Training Center, as well as a CDC School Health Index Auditor at NC School Health Training Center. So do you want to talk about those two positions? Yeah. So um, to be honest with you, we don't get, so our assistantships don't go through the summer and again, I pay for my life. So I needed a way to kind of get some funding and also stay involved in public health. So I was really fortunate that I got to be a contractor over the past two summers for the training center. Um, the first one was really, it was updating the NC health curriculum. So what students are learning in health. Um, and so I got to lead a lot of focus groups about what, um, what should be changed, what should be different, what do they want to leave the same, should, you know, certain um, things stay in certain age groups, should certain ones change, how would that work if we change this in this county, but then we didn't change it in this county. Um, so I, I got to use some of my qualitative um, research skills and um, got to meet a lot of really great um, health and health, specifically health teachers in North Carolina um, for the previous summer. And then last summer, yeah, there's this thing called the School Health Index, which basically the CDC tries to figure out what's going on health-wise in schools across the U.S. And schools are responsible for um, talking about the 11 different domains. So, like, do you offer free lunch? Do you have a vino? <coughs> Excuse me, coming off sickness. Um, do you have, um, like, certain types of lights? Are there water fountains? Um, how much physical activity do your students get every day? And so I was responsible for... Um, updating them. So having, um, figuring out if anything was incomplete, because the last time it had been done was 2020, 2019, right before COVID. And so my job was to go back in and say, hey, like, it's been a couple years, has anything changed? I can offer you money to update it. So the CDC knows what's going on. Here's some resources to update it. Um, so just kind of a different, so I, I, you know, my role is in sexual and reproductive health, but I had a really fun time. I got to meet all these cool um, health and PE teachers across North Carolina. I got to learn about the School Health Index. It was sponsored by our um, Nutrition and Physical Activity Grants. Um, so I think, again, going back to public health being super broad, like I do work in mental health. I do work in um, environmental health. I'm big in, um, you, know, gun, you know, gun safety. And so I think there's just, it was really great to be involved in that because it got me out of my SRH space for a little bit and got me to kind of get back to general public health. And that's important that you highlight that just that just because you are focusing on sexuality education in your PhD doesn't mean that you aren't able to dabble and touch on the other factors in public health. Like, as we said, there's so many intersectionalities in public health and it just being very broad. So, yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. And it's kind of cool to see, like, just your, the different kind of work that you did with the North Carolina School Health Training Center uh, overall. And uh, just generally speaking, so you're a PhD candidate now. I believe that you're supposed to be completing your program sometime this year. Mm -hmm. Do you have any takeaways to share with other PhD students, people thinking about their PhDs or PhD candidates? You know, the first thing is that I didn't know a DRPH existed, um, <laughs> which I think I had gone and gotten a DRPH. Um, but, you know, I think your PhD is all about what you make it. And it's really, a, it's really a marathon. It's not a sprint. Um, again, my program was super short and I've gotten out of it everything I've needed. Um, you know, I, I got a job right off the market. I was very successful and, you know, a little toot of the horn. Like I was pretty successful in my job in the job market. And I think that was because I knew what I wanted and I had the skills to get there. Um, but PhD experiences cannot be great. I think it depends on who your mentor is, what your support's like. Um, and how well you take care of yourself. And so I think throughout my PhD journey, I really had to do what was best for me a lot of the time. And that might mean making your advisor mad or making a partner mad at some points. But if you don't stop and take care of yourself, it will suffocate you. Um, <clears throat> you can always be researching. You can always be typing. You can always be teaching. But if you don't stop and go to the park <laughs> for an hour or two or go on vacation here and there, it just, it will make you happy. And so I think I... I might've made some people mad at some points, but I really tried to put myself at the forefront of my health. 
And <clears throat> I think that's so important because again, it's a marathon, you know, it, sometimes these programs are mostly four to five years and that's a long time to be, <laughs> you know, doing this. And so um, my biggest advice, yeah, is to, to really know who you are, establish some boundaries and stick to them. Um, my next thing is to take all of the opportunities that you can um, be involved in different organizations. You know, I was involved in Ada Sigma Gamma. I did the Sophie Edgeathon, <clears throat> which were really great because it exposed me to national organizations. I think it helped me make some, some connections in the field and some networking. Um, and I think sometimes doing research in other areas is fun. Like I did a little bit with sleep um, and it's fun to just bounce around sometimes. I think one of the other big things is that we coming in, I think there was a lot of pressure to know what we wanted to do. And I straight up with my advisor was like, I don't have a clue. I don't know. I like sexual and reproductive health. I'm going to end up with a PhD. We got to figure out. And so, you know, I think she put me on projects that I was, she was like, I think you might like this. Let's, let's do some data collection here. I know a faculty member doing this. Do you want to jump on this? And then I kind of got to narrow down. I don't like qualitative or maybe that's not feasible or you know, I really like the college population or older adults are for me or whatever that might be. So don't feel so much pressure to have it all figured out semester one, especially if it's like a four to five year program, like you got plenty of time. Use the first year to put yourself on everything you can, go to some conferences, get some funding, do some fun projects, work with your cohort mates, do some fun projects with them um, and take some pressure off yourself. And then, you know, when you get into year two, year three, then really start to hone down <clears throat> what you want to do, what your dissertation is, what your goal is. And, you know, I think by year three, you're a lot smarter and you have a lot more things figured out than you probably realize. Um, and so be confident in who you are and what you know. And sometimes you have to make people mad by your decisions and they'll be okay. Um, you are a baby doc. And I think that's a really important space to think about is that you are, you will be doctor or whatever, or PhD, whatever. And that, I think that means a lot to a lot of people and it should mean a lot to you. And so, be confident in your skills and your training and know that you are, you are the expert in whatever you're researching, even more than your committee is. Um, the next thing is like your committee is super important. Um, they have to play well together in the sandbox. Um, choose people that are going to respond quickly, give you really great feedback and be in your corner. If they don't do those three things, sorry, it's just not going to work this time because you spend so much time with them and you're interacting with them so frequently that if they're not on the same page, if they have their own agenda or um, <clears throat> they don't agree with you a lot, it's going to be a really uphill battle. Um, so use your first couple years to figure out like, who do you work well with? Who could be on my committee? Who responds well? Who is really great at methods? Who's really great at data analysis or whatever that might be? Um, and put together a committee that's going to, no matter what, bat, go to bat for you. Um, when something goes wrong, when that analysis is bad, when your IRB takes forever, whatever it is, that they are going to be like, you know what, the point is, Megan, PhD, that's what we're going for. So, you know, what do we need to do to get there? And I think I've been really lucky in that. And that's why my experience has been so positive. Um, and there are people going through it. So if, you know, if you're struggling, come chat with me, we can, we can, you know, I've been in the boat together, and I have really great cohort mates. Um, and I think they've also been the reason that I've gotten through this is because they're always there with me. Absolutely. And I love that, you know, like, you have to live your life for yourself. And especially in a stressful situation, like a PhD program, or any kind of um, terminal degree program, like, really making other people upset is, is fine once you are happy. And you're able to, to get what you need to get out of the program. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, and you are a part time NCAA volleyball referee. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. So um, I coached for most of my, all of my undergrad, my master's, and even my first year of my PhD, which I would not recommend. Um, <laughs> that was a, no, I was driving an hour a couple times a week. And, um, you know, I just realized that I wanted something a little bit more flexible. Um, and so refing allows me the frequency and the flexibility um, to ref on the weekend. So now I get to choose where I want to go. So next weekend, this weekend, I'll be in Atlanta. A couple weeks ago, I was in New Orleans. I get to generally I pick places where my close friends are and I go ref there. Um, and so, you know, I think it allows me to stay in the game. It gives me something to do other than research and teach. Um, and I think it's a really great way to make money. So um, I highly recommend finding a hobby that produces income <laughs> outside of your PhD if you can. None of my other cohort mates work outside of their degree. Um, <clears throat> I can't afford that. So for me, it's mostly a financial decision, but um, I love it. It's a great way to stay in the game, a great way to 
keep up with the sport, learn about the mechanism, see, kind of create a new community um, and travel because that's one of my other big passions. Yeah, great, great thing. And, and I feel like just the point of like trying to find things that disconnect you from the PhD grind and like the wood grind is, is important. And mm -hmm. to your point, like it, it's something that you enjoy and that's been a part of your life. So like, why not try to incorporate yeah. it? And you're getting paid from it and getting some travel out of it as well. So shout out to that, to those as well. Yeah. Yeah. And you're also the founder of Young Professionals of Sexual and Reproductive Health. So t t tell us about like, the thought process of starting this and then what is this organization about? <clears throat> yeah, so uh, to be honest with you, I am in, am, am in that kind of early career professional. As a PhD student, I find myself in this weird, I am an adult, but I'm still a student. <laughs> it's very weird. It's very in between. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> and I found myself kind of lost. I was like, I'm not a faculty member. I don't have all these people I can do research projects with but I'm not an undergrad student and I know more than them. So I was like, you know, where can I go to meet other people interested in, you know, sexual and reproductive health in general, not just education and not just research. And I'm involved in the American Public Health Association sexual and reproductive health section. Um, but for me, it just really wasn't giving kind of the close knit relationships that I wanted. So I was sitting at a coffee shop in my hometown. I had been thinking about it for a little while. And one day I just made a Facebook group and I didn't know what to call it. I think it was originally like students and early career people. And I don't know. I made up some name. I was just like, you know what? I'm going to start it um, <clears throat> and see how it goes. Um, and so our whole purpose is really to connect kind of students at any level, high school even, um, mostly college and above just because of legality. Um, but in any part of sexual and reproductive health, in any type of discipline, social work, teaching, um, nursing, PA, NP, public health anthropology, like anybody, mental health counseling, um, to connect um, students and early career professionals in those um, realms that are interested in sexual and reproductive health. So our big thing is really networking and connections, um, helping find other people doing similar work in similar spaces. Um, I just felt really disconnected and I wanted other people to talk with about what we're doing. So the big thing we do is really share what's happening around the world and around the, um, the US. Um, within sexual reproductive health. So I'm always posting job postings and professional development and um, events coming up. And I host my own speaker series about people in sexual and reproductive health, because like I told you, I had no idea this was a field and there are so many different, I forgot about um, like therapists. There's so many other careers you can do in sexual and reproductive health as a part of public health that I didn't know existed. And so um, twice a month, I do a public health speaker series where I bring in really cool people doing all sorts of jobs within sexual and reproductive health specifically to help students and young professionals be like, dang, that's really cool. I didn't know that existed. Um, so hopefully they cannot go through kind of the, what am I going to do um, after they get to college and say, I'm not sure. So the big thing is really just connect connecting um, <clears throat> bringing them some information about professional development and then bringing them together um, about once every other month to kind of mingle and get to know each other. Love that. And I, I think it's, it's cool that you're saying that, you know, you're part of the APHA sexual education um, section and yet they have, they, yes, they have great resources and whatnot, but you still felt a little bit disconnected. And in that you're like, okay, let me see how I can create something that, that is a resource and is helpful for the things that I wish I had and, and the passions and the work that I'm doing right now so that we can support the future generation as well as I can build network and just create more educational resources and just just more understanding of what you can do in public health and sexual and reproductive health and uh, sexuality education and, and everything like that. So, so that's awesome. And um, where, where can people, like if they want to be part of this group, where, where would they have to connect with? Is that just on Facebook? Yeah, so we have a Facebook and a LinkedIn and an Instagram. It's just Young Professionals of Sexual and Reproductive Health. Um, and we have a website, which is HTTPSS.YPSRH, our acronym. Um, and that's where we host all, we have information on all of our events. And we're going to be highlighting some upcoming speakers and some previous speakers. We're going to eventually start a blog. Um, so the website is one of them, but also LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. But we're mostly, mostly on LinkedIn and, and Facebook, a little bit on the Instagram. We're working on a, a marketing <laughs> scheme, but um, just type in Young Professionals of Sexual and Reproductive Health. And I can also send you that um, to share with people. 
Yeah, absolutely. There will be a link. If not below, just click the show notes button and you will find the links to that on the show notes page for this episode. So yeah, I appreciate you sharing that and I uh, hope that continues to grow and support the future, the current and future uh, prof- young professionals of sexual and reproductive health. Um, and then I guess getting into the vein of like you finishing your PhD program soon, where would you like to see yourself in the future? Whether that's like a year, five years, however you like to think about that. Yeah, well, I'm moving to Texas. Um, I accepted a faculty position at Texas A&M as an instructional faculty um, school of public health. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. (laughs) Congrats. Um, I had a a, a really successful um, uh, job search. I was really fortunate. Um, I think I applied to the right position and I think I I knew my strengths. And so um, I'm excited to teach um, in a really, really rigorous school of public health and to really you know, kind of for the first time in my whole life, do something that I love. Um, <clears throat> just for the fun of it, you know, I think I, my PhD was because I needed to get here, but now I'm like, here's the fruit of my labor. I'm going to teach public health, which is what I love. I'm going to get to work with athletes. I'm going to get to work with students. Um, so, you know, I think where I see myself in a year is teaching, uh, working with athletes, hopefully getting involved in wrestling somewhere in Texas. Um, it's huge in Texas. Um, you know, in five years, I think I hope to connect more to the um, sexual and reproductive health nonprofit space, um, maybe do some volunteer work for them. I'd love to get back into the classroom really implementing sex ed. Um, I'm teaching how to teach sex ed, but I would really love to get involved. Um, so I've applied to maybe be on some boards and um, hoping to get involved with some organizations in Texas that are doing sex ed for communities. Um, and you know, be a part of spaces again where they really lack leadership and need folks to volunteer. Um, I don't know necessarily what the future holds, but I think I'm excited to find things that bring me joy and really hone in on those and see how I can make a difference in those spaces. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that and we look forward to seeing all of that and congrats to you. I hope the move to to Texas is smooth and everything goes well there. Thank you. You're welcome. There's one other question that I have like written here before we move on to the previous five is so earlier you said that you are like you acknowledge that you are a white girl in the south when you when you're talking about sexual and reproductive health, sexuality education. Do you just want to like share a little bit more about like what that means from your perspective in doing this work in public health in the south as a white person? Yeah, yeah. You know, I think in I think social justice is becoming such a big part of public health, right? We realize that there are so many injustices and so many health disparities because of how our systems are set up in the U.S. And so I realize when I'm in a space that I have bring a lot of privilege to that. And so I think I've been doing, I've been trying to do a lot of work around who am I and what do I bring to a space? And if people don't look like me, how can I ensure that they feel comfortable, that they feel safe, that they feel included? So I've been doing a lot of professional development around that. I think I'm also trying to highlight and lift voices that don't look like mine um, and trying to give space for them to really give their lived experience. I think it's one thing to talk about doing it. And I think it's another thing to really give power to the people where power is due. Um, And I think a lot of it is just being quiet, to be frankly honest with you. I think it's, you know, I'm not the expert in, in you know different injustices because I haven't experienced that but I can lift up somebody who has I can support them I can be an ally I can you know stand up for them I can um you know be as anti-racist as possible I think it's just really kind of bring um that social justice framework to who I am and acknowledging my privilege and using my privilege to make it better um I think that's the only thing I really can do because um you know systems as we know take forever to change Um, but I hope I am doing my little piece to try to change them as much as I can. Um, and acknowledging that there is injustice and that there is, you know, a lot of isms happening in the world right now and not being a part of it and trying to stop it as much as possible. Um, there's some backlash to that. I'll be honest with you. Um, just trying to teach sex ed and, you know, bring in sex ed is tough in general because it's already feared. And then we try to intersectionality with gender and race and all sorts of things. And um, we have even more struggles, but I think that's where the work is. I think that is, you can't back down because it's difficult. You can't back down because it's inappropriate to some people Um, just because it's difficult doesn't make it wrong or um, in some cases illegal. Right. (laughs) Um, So I think, um, you know, I've really been doing a lot of introspective work to figure out what my privilege is and how can I use that to help others. Yeah, appreciate you sharing that. And I, I like you said, like, that is where the work is 
those intersectionalities of the difficulties of these conversations and appreciate your allyship appreciate you acknowledging and taking the steps to like just be an ally and showing up how you need to show up with your privilege whether that is stepping down or whether that is speaking up so that someone else is allowed to speak up and, and using that that so i appreciate you sharing that and i look forward to to everything that you have going on in your career and life and big move and et cetera, et cetera. So, so yeah. Um, okay. So cool. moving you on, moving you on to the curious five, the five questions that I ask all guests. Number mm -hmm. one, what advice would you give to a student trying to pursue a career in public health? Mm. What do I wish I had learned? I think just to be open, I think, <clears throat> you know, some people have a lot of really great experiences in high school and some people don't. And I think when you get into public health, you can say like, oh, Epi's boring or oh, environmental health is terrible. But like, I really hope that the environment, you know, the restaurant sticker that says A, B, C or D is good, you know? So I think just really trying to be open to, you know, different avenues in public health and not immediately say no to things because right off the bat, you're like, oh, that sounds terrible. Or I don't know if I'm going to like that. Just putting yourself out there and saying, yes, you can always never do it again. You can always say thank you, but no thank you. But if you never do it, you never know if you're going to like it. Just like me, right? If I had never asked for, you know, help in finding a job, I may never have gotten it. So just being open, um, put yourself out there, try not to say no. Um, you know, I think, I think <clears throat> being rejected is just another way of being redirected. So there's going to be letdowns, there's going to be hard days, but at the end of the day, if it's something that you love and really thinking about the communities that you're serving, I think it'll be really important to you. Love it. Number two, if you're talking to someone wanting to get into your position, what advice would you give them? And you, let's, let's talk about your future position. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it, the first thing is just talking to somebody who's currently in the position. You can hit me up. We can, we can have a conversation. I, you know, I love to talk. So um, I think figuring out, I tend to ask people why they do their job and why they're at the certain place that they're at um, because titles don't mean much without what you're doing. Um, so, you know, I think for me, I have to have a PhD to be in my position. So, you know, you have to figure out the educational requirements behind your position, but <clears throat> how did they get there and do they like it? Because a lot of people have jobs that they absolutely despise. So yeah. for me, quality of life and having a good life has become really, really important um, and that's why I didn't pursue a tenure track role. I didn't want the responsibility. I didn't want that. And so I made a couple people mad, but you know what? They don't have to do the job. So I think it's, you know, when you're thinking about this particular position, what educational requirements do you need? Do you like your job? And how can I help you get there? Um, that's the biggest thing. Find people in your corner. Find people that are going to help you get there um, and be an advocate for yourself and what you want to do. Right, right. Number three, what's something you're working on improving in your life right now? Oh, <clears throat> I think um, still working on boundaries. Um, I am, was a very big yes person. I think I had a pretty big complex of um, if you say no, somebody's going to be upset and I don't like that. So for me, I think I'm working on setting work-life boundaries, trying to be very productive in certain parts of my life, and then really taking time to rest. Um, I think if you never stop and rest, your body will stop you at some point. Um, and there is a point where there, it is too much, right? You can say, yes, 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 yes. But are you really giving everything you have to each one of these positions? Or are you kind of getting 5% here and 10% here and 5% there? So, you know, learning how to leverage your opportunities to the maximum and um, give 100% to one, maybe two things. Um, and that it's okay that if, you know, you say no, you're going to have an upper opportunity. So for me, boundaries making some, making sure that I'm doing things a hundred percent that I'm anything I say yes to that I'm going to do it fully. I'm going to do it really, really, really well. Um, and leave a good name with my mark, a good mark with my name. Yeah. Love it. And definitely something that I think we in public health need to, to, to be more cognizant of. So yeah, appreciate you that. And I hope that you're able to set more boundaries, um, for yourself. Thank you. Number four, professionally, do you recommend anything? outside of uh, young professionals of sexual and reproductive health? I will, I will, I will um, plug, you know, YPSRH, I think we're fabulous. Um, you know, I think as a student, you have a lot of really great opportunities to be a part of professional organizations. We're doing some really great stuff within the APHA SR sexual and reproductive health section. Um, we're really gonna try to get students involved. Um, but I think if there's a local organization too, like a, there's, there's a state 
APHA within each of your states. So like, I'm not involved with Alabama's because the Delta region, I didn't know a lot about, but if you're going to be, say you're going to be an undergrad for four years, like join the, the state APHA in your organization, because I got two scholarships through mine. Um, it's really great, especially if you plan to stay in that state. There's a lot of really great ways to network. Um, and it's generally smaller. APHA is ginormous. It can be very overwhelming, but the state ones are a lot smaller. You can meet other students, you can know other people, and you can, you can move up in leadership fairly quickly. Um, so I would think, try to look at some professional organizations. Um, Quad S is another one in sexual and reproductive health. Um, it's a little bit more sociology, kind of anthropology, so the society for the scientific study of sexuality. I love that one. It's not my home base, um, but I really like it. Um, and I went and I went, I got to visit Vancouver and it was really cool. Um, and not where I'll be in my home base, but you know, something I did on a limb. So I would say professionally to put yourself out there and get involved in at least one professional organization, if not something on your campus that's happening. Um, there's a lot of free things. So if you follow my thing in particular, I try to, everything I do is free, but a lot of the orgs I do, a lot of the orgs that I share are free because accessibility is key to my org. Um, <clears throat> so trying to find ways to be involved that don't cost a lot. So student orgs offer scholarships. Sophie offers a scholarship. Um, I was able to get one of those. APHA offers it. Um, and then some of the like smaller organizations offer scholarships and scholarships to their annual conference. So that's another thing that's big. Try to get to a conference, even if it's small, like Amar University hosts one. Um, and they're generally very affordable. And I'm sure if you said, I can't afford it, they would, they would let you come even without that. So get involved no matter how small um, and start working your way up. Appreciate that advice. I've not heard it uh, enough, but that, I think like, as you said, like a lot of organizations out there might be huge and they are smaller mm -hmm. state um, sections that you can work with that are a lot more approachable, especially if you're someone that's a little bit shy and then there are a lot of mm -hmm. other opportunities for that development. So I appreciate you sharing that. Sure. And then last but not least, where can people connect with you, Megan? Yeah, so I have a professional Instagram called Sex Ed with Meg. Um, you can search me there. It's Megan Williams. Um, you can also, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, just search Megan Williams and then my MPH and Chez. Um, that's kind of where I'm at right now. Um, probably won't, I don't know about Facebook, probably not. Um, but I think LinkedIn and <laughs> Um, Instagram would be great. LinkedIn, I'm is more of a professional space, but my sex ed is a professional space too. So um, follow me, we can chat, it'll be great. Awesome, and I'll be sure to put those in the descriptions and the show notes for anyone that would like to connect. But thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your story and sharing your why. And uh, I really, really appreciate it. Cool, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, 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 definitely gonna be very helpful to, to a lot of people out there. Um, so housekeeping items, everyone. Thank you all so much for watching or listening to this. Be sure to subscribe if you have not subscribed as yet. Leave a like if you're watching this on YouTube. Leave a five-star review if you're listening to this on any podcast platform and share it with a friend. That really helps show get out to more people and helps our reach. So thank you so much and have a good rest of your night or day or whatever it is. Peace. Thank you.